8.37 now in the Monday morning. Of the many personalities who came to prominence during the turbulent 60s, one of the few who's remained a constant in the public eye is Joan Baez. Today, our music correspondent, Rona Elliott, joins us. She sat down recently with Baez at her home in Northern California to find out what she's been up to. How you been, Rona? Great, Frank. Good to see you again. Over the last years, Joan Baez has continued to focus her energy on humanitarian projects. As well, she's just written an autobiography titled, And a Voice to Sing With. And now, after a long period of concentrated work on her voice, Baez is releasing a new album titled, Recently. Recently. There are probably a lot of people who assume you're still playing with a guitar and barefoot, but that is not the case at all with your new album, so why don't you tell me a little bit about it? Well, I made it barefoot, but actually, well, I, people just have to hear it, because it's, um, the, what I wanted in whatever this album would be was fresh and uh, with a great deal of integrity. And that's an interesting combination to try to achieve being me in the 1980s, but I think we've done it, so. You've chosen a lot of work with very current people. Yeah. Well, for me, the trick is to find something that has melody that interests me and that, you know, because my voice is my major asset, and um, words that have some power, strength, beauty, and so on, and you can find those. You have to look for them. Now, we have some Dire Straits and some Peter Gabriel and some U2, and then we have s some of my own. And um, it's a combination of things. What about the whole question with regard to you or other contemporary performers of not being timely? Um, I'm not. I am. I'm, I think the record I just made is timely. I, I think that's a perfectly valid criticism as far as the music. If people thought of me as a folk singer, folk singing went out of vogue. Undisputed queen of folk singing. <laughs> that's right. Well, where does she sit now, you know? <laughs> However, um, what about me has never been untimely has been my connection with, what, with what's going on in the world politically and socially. And again, in Europe, not only are they interested, but they would pursue that. I mean, I would be sought out of wherever I was traveling in Europe for pertinent questions about today's politics or some crisis here. Or, and in the States, um, again, I think what I was saying, that really, it was sort of like, well, she was right about the 60s. Ugh, God forbid she's right now. <laughs> we, we don't really want to hear about it. On the other hand, th I've always been treated with some, <laughs> some kind of respect because they will come around because, of, well, go get buys. But for the most part, it's get her to talk about the 60s. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. In the 60s, many people fantasized you and Bob Dylan being the perfect couple. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, um, throughout the book, you can get a sense that you were disappointed, personally disappointed, by the other path that he took. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that even if I didn't verbalize it or have it clear in my head, I saw those brilliant words and those brilliant songs as somebody who would, of course, pick up the banner and, and um, help somehow. He did more than many hundreds of thousands of people because he had that genius for those songs. And those are the best songs in our arsenal. In, in the arsenal for both civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. Um, Blowing in the Wind remains one of the most requested songs that gives people a feeling that they have some reason to be there. It reminds them of the times that were real. They want to use it again. But of course, I, and I end the book by saying maybe I'm always asking too much of people. And obviously, I do ask too much of people. So. You've talked a lot about dissatisfaction in the 80s in terms of young people's participation, but we're actually in the late 80s. Yeah. So what, what do you see when you look out there now? Well, um, I was really happy to read back and see what I wrote about Bono. Because I wrote Bono, then it's one of my gushy, dramatic, four-page letters saying, you are more than a rock act. You know? And now to walk into the Cow Palace and be approached by 15 kids with little petitions to free a bunch of Guatemalans, I think is good. I think there are people like Bono, um, Sting, Peter Gabriel, who may... I mean, we have... You have to realize that in the Western world, since the 60s, there have not been heroes. There have been, there's been Ronald Reagan, there's been um, Rambo, 
and they've been rock stars. I'll take the rock stars, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I put my money right there for now and see what all we can do together. Mm -hmm. And then I think it'll be more than that. I think rock stars are not prepared to be leaders, but they are prepared to change a general tone of enormous selfishness. Perhaps, we'll see. Many of them aren't, but some of them are. Hmm. What would you tell this generation, your son's generation, about why they should become active? Well, first I'd wait for him to ask, you know, because you can't tell. And I've certainly learned firsthand, 17-year-olds, anything, unless there's some little part of them that's, willing, that's interested or has asked for that information from you. What I just say is about my own life, that where the fun began was with an involvement with people. I mean, there are haves and there are have-nots. And the have-nots just suffer just extraordinarily. I think the trick is to talk about, is the fun that they want to have, fun, 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 go to the beach and surf and hang out and party and drink and take noon and do drugs and whatever, is that really going to hold, you know, going to hold things together? Is that really what they're looking for? And then you can't say, because I know you'll feel better if, but you can say, this is what, for me, what really made a difference. We'll talk with Joan Baez about her life in politics, her marriage, and men, right? She's a strikingly handsome yeah. woman. Beautiful. Isn't she? Yeah. In her new book, And a Voice to Sing with, Joan Baez talks about her social and humanitarian commitment as well as her personal life. But whatever else was going on in her life, Baez lent her voice to those who needed it. So one day, the 80s will be remembered not as the selfish and the me generation, but a generation of people who refused to tolerate injustice, who stood up and said, we will be heard, we will be loud, we will be clear, we will be heard. Shout, shout, let it all out. These are the things I can do without. Come on, yeah, I'm talking to you. Come on. You mentioned uh, at the beginning of your book the kind of personal gifts you've been given. And my arrogant statement about I was born gifted? No. <laughs> That's a little arrogant. <laughs> no, but I mean, for some people, singing would have been enough, and you chose mm. to make it singing and a whole lot of other things. At what point did you decide that singing wouldn't be enough? See, that's why I refer to the two gifts together. One, the gift of having been given this voice. The other is the gift of really wanting to share that. I mean, that's not something I wake up and think, oh gosh, I suppose I have to go out and, mm -hmm. you know, become involved <laughs> in social issues. It came so naturally to me. And I don't think we ever know what makes us, you know, why somebody was born to be a skier on the slopes and why somebody else mm -hmm. was born really interested in humankind and I don't think that's necessarily any great virtue it's just the way it has always been that's when I'm most adrenalated and most happy um, do you remember the point at which it became extremely clear that you would have a very active and participatory life in terms of causes that that was really the road you would choose to go down probably what's in the book about um, the demonstrating at my own high school you know and then they, they had an air raid drill, which I knew was baloney. It was Palo Alto High School right around here, and they were trying to get all the kids to believe if they just got home and got in their cellars that the missile on its way from Moscow wasn't going to hassle them, you know? And you were 16. I was 16, and I went and looked at my father's physics books and found out how many minutes it took to get from Moscow to Palo Alto High School for that <laughs> missile, and I realized we were all being gypped. <laughs> so I stayed in school. And that was the first time you really hit the papers, too. That was the first time I hit the papers, and it was a very, it was scary, because I, I planned to do it with one other person, but we were separated at the time of day. We were in different classes, and she got scared and went home, and so I was alone in that little mission. But I didn't really question it. I mean, it wasn't that it was right or wrong, which is sort of scary to do. I was happy to find out that after David had been in jail for two and a half weeks, you already had a very, very good hunger strike going with 42 federal prisoners, none of whom were draft people, so... Your marriage to David Harris was seen by some people as Mr. and Mrs. World Peace, Mr. and Mrs. Draft Free Sister. Was it tough living under that kind of lights were on you at the time? No, it was just tough being married. I, I wasn't cut out for it, though I wanted so desperately to do that and do it well, and I worked very hard, and we certainly had some wonderful times. Um, he was better off not being married to me, you know, and I'm better off not being married. But I would say, no, the pressure from the outside, we thrived on it. I mean, that's how we had met in the first place, and we're both speakers, we're both public people, and we probably did better with that than without it. 
Now, you said that living alone is really the best for you, which is a very, I mean, you're still a young woman. That's a very harsh Thank thing you. to say, though. <laughs> I mean, are you serious? Is that, do you feel yeah. as if you've really made that definite choice? Well, I've choice? lived alone way more than I've lived with somebody. And, um, yeah, I've made the choice. I, it doesn't mean that something couldn't come along and change that, but I really would be surprised. I really, um, enjoyed, uh, your discussion of what it was like backstage at Live Aid, and you said that when you were around um, Duran Duran's John Taylor, and you realized you didn't know how to conduct yourself around men That's anymore. <laughs> That's absolutely true. I was gaga. He was so beautiful looking, and then Don Johnson walked in, and I just went apart. You know? So I don't think people look at you that way. I mean, I, I know that they don't, and I'm sure this will be a shock to them, and I hope they can tolerate it, because that's how I am. I love gorgeous men. And you also are assured of a very short relationship with a gorgeous man, so it takes care of everything. You don't have to worry about long-term, anything serious, intimacy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Smart work. <laughs> Rona, thanks so much.